getting out of the way. Now, as I, as I read uh, this session today, I was very, very interested. And uh, I thought, this is very, very different. And I got a chance to meet Amber last night at the Amazing Race. So here's a bit of uh, Amber's bio. Uh, Amber Case is a cyborg. Uh, hang on a sec, I've underlined the wrong bit. Amber Case is uh, a leading research in the field of uh, cyborgs and the interaction between humans. She is a human, right? When she comes out here, you may go, oh, you really? But she is, all right. She spends a lot of time uh, uh, looking at cyborg technology. She's been published in multiple magazines, including Forbes, Wired. Uh, she's, also, uh, she's also one of the 30 top-ranked women as influential in the software industry. She, she writes and she's been published in many places. And uh, Amber was named one of, one, uh, one of the National Geographic's Emerging Explorers and made Inc. Magazine's 30 Under 30 with co-founder of uh, Geologic. Amber is going to talk to us about some things we don't generally get to hear about at conferences like this. And uh, I'd now like to introduce Amber Case, if you'd like to join us. Once again, Amber is not a cyborg. <laughs> Thanks very much. Everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Good, good, excellent. Let's wait a little bit for a few people to fill in over there. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's really great to take so many planes to get to a country where it's winter time, because I just spent a lot of time sweating in the summer, so this is very refreshing. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the future of the interface and a bit about cyborgs. First off, could you all put your phones up in the air really quickly? and hold them there. There we go. Excellent. OK, Glass. Take a picture. All right, great. That's perfect. Thank you. So the faster you held those up, the more cyborg-like you are. Um, some of you are more reluctant cyborgs than others. You left them in your bag. You don't really want to hold them up that quickly. Um, but in fact, we're all cyborgs. Um, I'm wearing a Google Glass right now. Um, later after this, I can show a bit more of, of what it does. It should come out next year. Um, but I've been wearing this just to see what it's like to have some sort of information in my face sometimes. Um, we're all technically cyborgs. It's, it's not that we need to have something attached to us in order to be cyborgs, but that every time we interact with a piece of technology, we're in a symbiotic relationship with that piece of technology. And that's uh, it, whether it's allowing us to store information inside that piece of technology or uh, interacting with our brains in a new way, that makes us cyborgs. And this isn't really a new concept because um, the, the actual term cyborg showed up in a 1960 paper on space travel, and here's the definition. An organism to which exogenous components have been added for the purpose of adapting to new ambient spaces. So the whole idea is that humans attach external stuff to themselves to make it possible for them to be in new spaces that they wouldn't normally be in. Uh, in this case, uh, a person in a spacesuit is the most ultimate cyborg. They're in an area that, as a human, you're not supposed to be in, and yet they're interacting symbiotically with their environment. Um, but this, isn't, this, has not, this is really not new at all. Um, for thousands of years and even millions of years, we've been interacting with some sort of external devices. We've co-created ourselves with technology since the beginning. There is no technology without us, and there is no us without technology. Um, but the main difference and why it's kind of important to look at how cyborgs are evolving now and, and how technology is affecting us now is because um, the shape and size of a physical object, like this hammer, is really an extension of the fist. It helps you to hit something harder, or a knife as an extension of a tooth. The, the shape and form of this hasn't really changed over thousands of years. You could say that it's stabilized. Um, but the shape and form of an external device that's, that's, um, that's technological, that has components that must be charged, has changed dramatically over time. Um, you could say that it's larger on the inside now than it is on the outside. Um, so if you look at the evolution of this, it's not inherently stable. And the difference is because the, there's the physical extension of self with all these physical tools that we've had for years and cars and things like that. And now we're going into the mental extension of ourselves. And that inherently is unstable. It's not even the same size and shape over time. If you look at a computer in the 1950s, it would be the size of a gymnasium. And now if you look at you know, simply an iPhone or a mobile device, it has many more times that function, but it's in this tiny little shape. <coughs> so really, we're seeing these interfaces and devices that are getting smaller and smaller, these buttons that are basically liquefying, 
um, where instead of having a button that you have to actually rewire in, in the back of the system, you, um, you now have a, a liquid crystal display that a button can be anywhere. And if you want to change what the button does, you go around in the software and change the button. And so I was really interested in this um, growing up because I really wanted to know what the next generation of the button was. If things go from solid and then to liquid, well, the next step must be air because I had learned about the water cycle. So I thought, you know, th obviously this must be true. So I thought, if the next step of the button is the air, what does that look like? And I'll talk about that after I go through a little bit of history. Um, so traditional anthropologists go out into another place, usually a field site that is not the, the traditional world that the anthropologist comes from. And they say, oh, how interesting these people are, how curious their tools are, let's look at kinship. Um, and then they write a paper and they bring it back to whatever country they happen to be from. Well, the cyborg anthropologist looks around them and says, how curious these people are, how interesting these, these things are in their pockets that cry and you have to pick them up and soothe them back to sleep, that need um, to be fed every single night by plugging them into the wall and don't even last longer than one or two years before they start to make us look bad and look embarrassed to hold them up uh, next to our ears because they're out of date. You know, what a curious society that we live in. It's very hard uh, when you're embedded in something, when you know, you look back 10 years and suddenly your entire reality has changed. You wake up next to a phone and you check your email when you, when you wake up in the morning um, uh, and actually look at it and say, what's happened? Like, what's actually changing? Because it's, it's this slow motion, even though it seems very fast, that allows us to think it's pretty normal to do certain things. Like this that I'm wearing on my head is not very normal at this point in time, but at some point it could be very normal. So let me give you some history. Uh, who knows about this guy? Uh, raise your hand if you do. OK, great, two people. This is fantastic. So this guy's name is Steve Mann. And um, when he was a kid, he was very interested in a number of things. One, his dad was in the textile industry. And two, when he was about 10 or 12, he walked down the street and there was a television repair shop. And he went and talked to the guy in the television repair shop and said, hi, I'd like to work with you. And the guy said, well, sorry, you're too young. I don't, I don't think you should be working here. Why do you want to work here anyway? And Steve Mann said, well, I want to make a television screen so small that it can fit inside my glasses, and then I can look at reality differently. And the television repairman said, um, uh, you're definitely not going to work here. Like, what, what are you doing? Um, so Steve Mann kept going back to this place again and again, every single day, relentlessly. And this guy said, OK, fine. If you can solve this particular television repair problem that I haven't been able to solve in a long time, then I'll let you, uh, I'll let you work here. So of course, Steve Mann figures it out really, really quickly. Um, and the guy says, OK, I'm gonna, I'll hire this guy. So Steve Mann was working with televisions and watching televisions as they change from cathode ray tube to LCD and all the different changes in televisions. And um, in the 80s, he started wearing, uh, this is about 40 pounds of equipment. Um, uh, on his head, and he had battery packs and things like that around his waist. And really what he wanted to do is have a signal anywhere, um, because he was really sick of watching people contorted over a computer, waiting to be at a terminal in order to type something. He said, well, why, why do we have con to conform to computers? Why can't con technology conform to us? And we are able to thus wear it when you know, we're in the park and we get an interesting idea, why can't we just type it right then? Why do we have to wait until we go somewhere to a blank page and, and have no inspiration? This doesn't make any sense. So he started building these things. Um, you can see here there's a, the, there's a whole television screen in, in front of his eye um, and he's wearing, um, he's wearing a helmet uh, and he's got, if you can see up there, two antenna uh, out of his head so he can get a signal. He would go to the top of the highest buildings at like MIT campus, put a radio tower up there, and then get a signal through campus. So he's doing this all through radio. Um, he also, in order to get a signal, would put silver metallic gel on his hair, or like this whole metallic gel experimenting with this. And during this time, he met uh, this, his future wife, actually, which was great. Um, it took him about a year to convince anybody else on campus to actually don all of this equipment. Um, and uh, the other thing that he really wanted to do was see the messages that were his own. If you think of reality, it's full of advertisements, and they're not your own messages. So he said, well, what if I could understand where the ads were, um, recognize the rectangle, and then cancel it out in real time in my vision and put something else over it? So he did. Um, working with uh, James Fong, who now works at NVIDIA, he would basically have a, a camera feed information in on one side of his head, processing loop around the back, 
and then feed into his other eye this, this filtered reality, which he called a diminished reality, because it's not that you're augmenting or adding to reality, there's too much reality already. It's that you're taking away the stuff that you don't actually want. So this is him actually getting a text message from his wife that says, you know, you've gone too far, take a left on Bay Street, because she can see his real-time feed through her own heads-up display at home and can actually direct him where to go in case he gets lost. Um, this is a recreation of their first date um, when, they, when they went on a first date. Um, they both wore a heads-up display and a camera, and um, they watched the date from the perspective of each other. Um, so here's an example of him canceling out uh, an ad for L'Oreal and um, actually getting a research paper that he's working on over it. So he can read this research paper. Um, another thing that he did is, uh, so his wife could say, every time Steve Mann sees a logo for Star Market or um, any of these grocery stores, uh, automatically have this display come up. And this one says, Steve, remember to pick up the 2% milk. Like, you know, this is $500,000 of equipment for a very domestic purpose, right? Uh, but you can see that the message will always float around the star market um, until he gets the milk. And then when he gets the milk, then he can just hit, like, dismiss, and then the message will go away, right? He never sees it again. Um, the other thing is that he could go into a supermarket and only see the brands of the stuff that he wanted. So he could go in the supermarket. His wife could be like, I don't really like that brand of milk. He could exit out and never see that brand of milk again. Um, he also, uh, there, there are a number of people in this, in this kind of cyborg world where, um, you know, you'd have to learn about faces and names of people, but uh, Steve Mann would just assign numbers to everybody. So this is cashier 623, and this is the purchase. Of course, he's purchasing a ton of batteries uh, because he needs to wear them around his waist. He's probably like this guy here again with the batteries. Um, and so he can have a whole history of who he's talking to. So often, like, Steve Mann would talk to somebody and be like, hey, um, uh, how are your kids doing? And know that they were three years older because he had a little calculator in the background calculating how old their kids were um, instead of having to remember it. Um, but he knew that over time, this would become lighter and lighter weight. So um, here he's in 1980. 40 pounds, 20 pounds, 10 pounds, you know, in 1998, he looks kind of awesome. I mean, he's got his sunglasses. Um, and if you look in his left hand, he's got this little device um, called a twiddler, which allows you to um, type one-handed um, while you're walking down the street. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the idea behind input is that, you know, traditionally you have to have a keyboard, and this leads to RSI, and it's not very flexible. Um, when people have these heads-up displays all the time and or they're wearing them around, no one wants to be able to, uh, uh, no one wants to have to always talk to them through audio. Uh, it's really annoying. Plus, reality is not this perfect, pristine place like there are in all these research videos where everything's perfect and everyone has the same accent and your computer can always understand you. Like, that doesn't work. You know, all my friends that are from different countries, like, Glass can't understand them because they have a weird accent. Um, and, and also, when you're trying to use something like this, like, I want to get driving directions somewhere, um, and a big truck drives by, the, the device is like, what? And you end up yelling at the device and acting more like a computer than you should. And the whole point of wearable technology is to free you up to be more of a human instead of less of a human. Get yourself out of your screen and into the real world and not have you almost get hit by a car when you walk through an intersection because you're texting. So the whole point behind this input is that you know, there's this, but there's no input device for it yet. So Thad Starner, who is one of the people that worked with Steve Mann early on, um, was very interested in these one-handed keyboards. Uh, the problem is that we have a lot of persistent architecture in the way. Um, this is a prototype of the very first mouse, and it got, it stuck, basically. Doug Engelbard, the inventor of the mouse, was kind of bothered by this because his early prototypes of the mouse said, okay, this is a temporary holdover until we get the most efficient way to interact with a screen. And before this, you were interacting with a screen with a light pen, so you could actually pretty much touch the data um, and interact with it a little bit more directly. And then there was this mouse that people had to use, and people have been using mice until you know, Steve Jobs tried to whisk it away and have you know, direct touch interfaces and little magic mouses and things like that. So the persistent architecture um, often gets in the way of having more efficient um, input devices. Uh, and then now we have this liquid interface. We can actually touch the data. What a relief. Um, 
Now, people tried to fix this. They tried to make their own mobile input. This is terrifying. This is basically a gargoyle-like device. Um, it's, uh, if, if you saw somebody wearing this and walking around with it, you'd probably run away from them. And um, honestly, people would often cross to the other side of the street when, when Steve Mann was walking down the street in Toronto. Um, when I visited him a few uh, weeks ago, everybody came up to him and said, oh my gosh, is that Google Glass? And he said, no, this is like a 14-year-old prototype uh, of you know, something that I built. You know? um, uh, so this ended up being the thing that everybody liked. Um, the problem is this one's a bit too big. I think there needs to be like small, medium, and large. The whole point is that you play it kind of like a guitar. You do corded input, and you can type with one hand, and then on the top, there's like um, there's a mouse, and there's shift and control. So after a while, students in Thad Starner's classes and, and Th Steve Mann's classes would actually be taking all of their notes for all their papers with this twiddler, and they'd be walking through the park writing their dissertations and programming like shorthands for equations into it, and they had a much better life because they weren't like this all the time. They were walking around and actually being healthy. So this is the Twiddler 2. Um, it's now made by a company in Canada. Hopefully there will be a Twiddler 3 that has Bluetooth that can actually interact with this device because then you won't have to speak at it all the time and, and have it misunderstand you and look silly. Um, so this is the, uh, these are some more images of somebody using it. Uh, this is also, uh, this is actually from a research paper by Thad Starner. Thad Starner um, is now working on the Google Glass team. Um, there were some typing programs for kids with this. It doesn't take that long to learn. Um, but again, it's, it's probably just as hard as learning QWERTY when you're, um, when you're young. So today, Steve Mann looks pretty much like this. Every, things are mostly dissolved. It's not really that big of a deal. Um, he is teaching his daughters how to weld. Apparently, he learned how to weld when he was four, so he thought his daughter should learn how to weld as well. <laughs> and he also invented a, a method for seeing better when you're doing arc welding where, uh, called HDR. So he's the inventor of HDR, where it takes m a number of different pictures at different uh, brightness and contrast and fuses them all together so you can see all of the, uh, all of the dark points and all of the light points that would usually blow up the camera. Um, so here's some more pictures of this board group. So as you can see, there's kind of two, um, two types. The Thad Starner um, over on the right-hand side is in the, like, the long trench coat. So you're already seeing kind of a, a divergence of species. And then the short, uh, short leather coats are, are the other version. And that's the, the Steve Mann uh, version at MIT Media Lab. Moving forward, you can see that Thad Starnes group was definitely more fashionable. Um, this is the, a, a modification of the private eye. Uh, it's a little heads-up display that was fused into some glasses. Um, and everybody's you know, hanging out with these devices. Um, I was just at Media Lab uh, a few days ago. And the guy on the very right-hand side um, was kind of like a classical uh, philosopher-type poet. He would always wear a beret with his heads-up display. And he's a very interesting character. Um, and then people were starting to make their own weird things. There was the MyView goggle, and you could cut it in half, and you could start. I have a bunch of these at home where like, I was walking around with a, you know, half of a heads-up display with like a Twiddler keyboard, and people thought I was crazy. Um, but really, I just wanted to be able to write while I was walking around in the park. Uh, so now Google Glass is out, and the problem with Google Glass is that it's basically a computer screen that floats in front of your vision, um, but it doesn't augment anything or diminish anything. It doesn't do live, real-time replacement of an advertisement, for instance. So you don't, you don't get that awesomeness that, um, because this is basically an early prototype, and it takes pictures and reads your mail and things like that. Uh, but this is, this is the first part. Um, people are just as terrified of this as they were when cell phones came out with cameras. I actually was thinking of making a blog where I took all of the articles from 2000 and 2001 when cameras came out on smartphones and uh, replaced them with Google Glass. It's like, oh no, it has cameras. What happens if you walk into the bathroom? Oh no, somebody has a phone. They could be taking a picture of you. No, no, life is really bland and boring and no one really wants to do that. Um, so, uh, so we're going through the same thing. Um, I don't know how long it will take for this to become normal or if it will ever become normal or if you know, smartwatches will become normal instead. Um, I can't predict the future there. Usually what happens is somebody does something 30 or 40 years ago and then it takes a really long time for it to show up in reality. So with that, the future, as much as I can tell you about it. The thing that I really liked during my research was the idea of calm technology. I saw that all these people in wearable computer were we're really embodying this idea of calm technology where 
The computer is invisible until you need it. Technology gets out of the way and lets you live your life instead of showing up all of the time and bugging you or forcing you to go through tons and tons of menus or forcing you to pair all these different objects with each other or you know, getting you in a car accident because you're looking down at something. So the idea of calm technology was invented in the 70s by a Xerox Park uh, researcher named Mark, Mark Weiser. He's also considered the father of ubiquitous computing. But he was very interested in having these devices that were, that were calm uh, companions in your life that would just help you out, that you had a nice symbiotic relationship, but they weren't always saying, oh, hey, here's an alert. Hey, this, you know, I think an alert would be very useful if you're walking into a field with poison ivy, um, but not that you just got an email because somebody updated a post on Facebook. Like, that's not, that's not useful. Um, so the idea of calm technology, uh, you can also apply to interfaces. So where instead of you clicking a button all the time, your actions become the button. Um, where the interface itself is invisible and you walk into it. Um, so when I read about this, I realized that my question about what the next generation of the interface was might be solvable if computers were going wearable and your device could know your location. Then you could technically take a map, draw a circle or a polygon on a map, and when you get into it, you basically are pressing the button and anything can happen. And you could also get something like ambient notifications where you know, data is pushed to you. And not data like there's a Starbucks coupon near you. Stuff that's, that's realistic, like the bridge that you usually cross is going to be closed um, on Saturday. Or this building that you usually walk by, here's the entire history behind it. Like, useful things like that. Um, and that your input can come in many forms, whether it's the temperature outside and it's really hot, or if, um, you know, if you're going by a certain place that your friend went by, or um, or any of these things. Your input doesn't necessarily have to be in a button on a click on a screen. It can just be you. It's natural inside your environment. Um, so some of these, like speed, so only send a message if somebody's going below 20 miles an hour or below 10 miles an hour because they're walking and you know, they can actually get to it, or if they're going too fast, or time of day, you know, only send a message to somebody between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. at night. Um, and so I started researching this. Has anyone built this technology? Because Mark Weiser had these fun things called uh, the park badge. And you'd walk into Xerox Park. It would know that you were at Xerox Park. And your computer would take you know, five minutes to, to start up back then. So you would go in. The building would know that you were there. Turn on your computer in the background. You could go talk to people, get some coffee. And by the time you went to your terminal, your computer was on. Fantastic. All booted up. Um, but nothing had really happened since. There were some companies that raised millions and millions of dollars to do this, and then they fizzled out because they were trying to rely on advertising instead of the real world. Um, so I, I started looking. I said, hmm, there's this big difference that's going on. There, there are some of these things that were built on feature phones. So in 2006, this woman made this research paper and this app. Um, it was just location-based reminders. If I get to the store, leave myself a note to pick up the milk. When I get to the store, um, I'll get that note, right? So I don't have to remember all the time. Um, when her research was published in some newspapers, people were pissed off. They said, this is what our public funding goes towards, location-based reminders for our phones. I think this is crap. Like, I would never use this. It was just very intense. And I read this in, in, in you know, probably 2007. I was like, wow, people are not ready for this yet. And then the iPhone came out, and I realized that there would probably be a little GPS on it. And the things that were holding back this industry were, were enormous. It was... You know, there's no store for you to get apps on. It's really hard for you to download apps. Um, the biggest thing was that GPS drained your battery completely. Um, and, you know, people didn't have smartphones yet. So I was kind of waiting. Um, and then I met my co-founder. So he was really interested in making what was formerly Invisible visible. So he was taking this Windows Phone 6.5, um, this, like, early smartphone with a GPS tracker on it, and he was tracking his location at five second intervals. And he had been doing this for years. So he started making these maps. And this is just all the points that he's ever taken um, based on speed. So you can actually see on the map, um, the red parts are him going really fast on the highway. Um, this, is, this is a map of Portland, Oregon. And then over to the, the left-hand side, you can see him going really slow driving around looking for parking. Um, and he would do that all the time. You can see all the different roads that he's taken. And I said, wow, you're basically developing this picture over two or three years. And he said, yeah. I said, well, this is actually your personal view of a city. Like, this is you personally and all of your movement. This is fascinating. He said, yeah, it's pretty interesting. And he had all these extra batteries that we'd carry around with him. 
And I said, well, what could you, you know, I, I had given all these speeches before about, you know, your phone should know where you are, and when you get to a place, you should get a message. Um, and I said, you know, can we integrate that into the system? And so he said, yeah, you know, if you know somebody's location, even rough, you can start making these invisible buttons on maps. And when they go into the location, they get a message. Um, but the real problems were this battery drain um, and privacy, right? People were terrified that, you know, a third party service would use their location against them. Um, so we want to do the opposite. We said, let's use location to empower people instead of make them terrified. Let's make it cool instead of creepy. Um, so we made this little side project called Geoloki. And we said, this is the ne next generation location platform. You know, contribute to our project. This is fun. It was our side project. And all these people started calling us up. And they said, oh, you're trying to solve these problems that we've had for a really long time. Can we buy this service? And I said, sure. You know, gave them some random numbers. They sent us checks. We built some stuff for them. We realized, hmm, there might be something more to this. We can quit our jobs. So we quit our jobs and raised some money. Um, and our tenants were location should empower people instead of try to take away power. It should allow you to have a remote control for your life. It should allow you to interact with things in a new way and get information when you need it, not all the time. Um, and uh, so we started building things. Uh, the first thing we built is this thing called GeoNotes, where you could go to an app like you know, AaronPK.com slash GeoNotes or CaseOrganic.com slash GeoNotes. And there would just be a map. And you could drag a little circle anywhere on the map and send a message and set it up. And um, if I walked through that circle at some point, then I would get the message. And there was a little Geiger counter on it that said whether I would be likely or not to be in that place in the future with a, with a percentage. So it wouldn't actually give away my location. So, I had, so we had the privacy thing covered. And so I opened up these maps. I said, everyone can leave these messages. And over the next like two months, I got thousands of messages from people. I, I would be driving, um, or I'd be like biking, and I'd stop, and I'd look, and my phone was filled with messages like, hey, this is our third grade class, and we left you a message at a stoplight so you could see, or hey, um, there's a blackberry bush uh, over here, and they'd leave a message from like, you know, um, uh, November to like a certain time when the blackberries would be there. You should go pick blackberries. And this one guy put messages over all the bridges in Portland with trivia about the bridges. This many people go over the bridge. This is when it was built. You know, this, this is, uh, you know, the controversy about it and left a Wikipedia article. And I realized that what was going on uh, was that there was all this data that was stuck on the web and it needed to be placed where it was actually supposed to be like where you are, <laughs> instead of you going to Wikipedia and saying, hmm, this is a very interesting article, and then forgetting about it. It needed to be where you were at that time. And it was really hard. So what we were doing is making, um, making a subscription system where you could subscribe to data, but we still had a problem with the actual data and getting it into the right format. And this is still holding back the industry. Um, so we got all these different notifications, you know, I'm on the bridge, great. Um, and then Aaron, my co-founder, would subscribe to the message, and he'd start getting these ambient updates of where I was. You know, be like, uh, Amber's five minutes away from Aaron, and then he'd know to go downstairs and unlock the door um, uh, to the office. And we had these very interesting things that we were doing. The, the next experiment we did was that we hooked it up to an X10 controller system at our house, and when we got home, the lights would turn on automatically, and when we left, the lights would automatically turn off, um, because the phone noticed that we weren't at home, and there was this GPS circle around the house. Um, then we hooked it up to more things, like the house actually saying, welcome home, which uh, was scary. Uh, <laughs> um, then we found all these databases of data. What can we do? Uh, we had a hyperlocal weather app where it literally, within three blocks, could figure out what was going to happen in that period of time. So we hooked that up, and using your rough location of you know, three or four block radius, we'd start to get these alerts, be like, in five minutes, there's going to be a thunderstorm. It's going to last for 40 minutes, and then it's going to taper off. And so we'd look at our phone and be like, yeah, right. Like, this, is, this is ridiculous. And five minutes later, sure enough, thunderstorm, 40 minutes later, gone. Um, we were walking around with some, some clients, and we were exiting a restaurant. And uh, we we're like, oh, no, it's going to rain. But it only rained for 10 minutes. So we either go now, or you know, we hang out here for 10 minutes. And the guy was like, yeah, right, <laughs> and it starts raining immediately. Countdown, 10 minutes, OK, no more rain. Great. <laughs> so we're using this for biking and things like that. 
Um, then we hooked it up to all of the bus stops in Portland, Oregon. So when you got to a bus stop and it noticed that you waited there for 15 seconds, it would automatically send you when the next bus would show up so you didn't have to like text something or look at your phone um, or ask. Uh, a lot of these don't have the schedules on them so there's no way to know when the next bus is going to come and this was the real time transit system. Uh, the cool thing about Portland, Oregon is that the government's very involved with open data initiatives so they were publishing all of this stuff instead of on a PDF that you had to parse out as actual live data feeds so we could start playing with it. Um, and then we needed to test all of the different phones in the system. And we, our budget for the startup, I don't know, 100 bucks each, you know, one for the LLC and uh, one for the, I, the, the Apple Store developer license. So we said, well, we don't have enough money to get, you know, 50 test phones or however many we need. And we we're going to the store spending like 1400 bucks and then taking all the phones back in a week uh, before we had to pay for them. And the guys at the store were getting really annoyed. And they're like, why are you doing this? Well, we need test phones. And none of these companies allow developers to, to have test phones. We have different GPS chips on every device. So we made this, this game. We basically said, how do we get a bunch of people with different phones to run around in the real world? So we made this game and called it Map Attack. It's basically a real life Pac-Man for two teams. You go into, you go into the city streets and you make a map. So I basically, I would, I would um, uh, load a map, put all these different GPS circles on it with different point values. Some were 10 points, 20 points, 50 points, 30 points. Um, the 50 pointers people went crazy over. Um, and then you bring everybody into a park, then I'll open up the app, they get assigned to a red or blue team, and they have to run into the dots in order to activate them and turn them red or blue. Now, we didn't know that this had never been done before because the problem with this in real time with location on mobile devices is that every single phone in the game has to subscribe to every other phone's movement in real time and show every single movement on the map and all of the GPS fences turning different colors in real time for it to work. Uh, so we ended up hacking it one night and one of the guys on our team did something that hadn't been done before with a programming language and he got flown out like two days later to this conference where they were just like, I didn't know you could do that. This is great, fly out. Um, and meanwhile, we had all of, our, our, all of the test data. You know, We had all these iPhones and Androids running around for hours and hours at a time. We got the test data in and we didn't have to spend $1,400. <sighs> so we debuted this at Stanford University. We were at a, a, a conference called Wear Camp. And you can see the game I didn't do very well on the blue team. The red team was crazy. I don't know what they were doing. Some kids grabbed their parents' phone and just ran all over Stanford campus, uh, trying to get as many dots as they could. We had a lot of caveats. We said, you know, don't run into traffic. Like, be really careful. Um, but what ended up happening is we were all sitting in front of our computers at this conference. Everybody wanted to walk outside. Everyone wanted to walk around the university. But we had no incentive to do so because it was much more fun to just be on the internet. So this was... This was interesting because the minute we had these invisible dots and points that people could actually run after, they were running outside. And just like a kid where you're running for you know, three miles and you don't even notice until your mom calls you back for dinner, um, we didn't notice that we had been running for hours uh, trying to get these invisible points. Um, and in a way, I really wanted this game to be like that experience when you're a kid where you're a bunch of kids in the neighborhood block and you say, okay, let's play this game. Here's the rules. Okay, go. And it's all in your heads, and it's in this like great, this great ecosystem that kids have for coming up with games. In this case, you know, adults kind of lose that after a while. They can't go into that dream world, you know, when you're playing with Legos and there's like monsters and dragons, even though they don't exist. Um, and so I really wanted to have an excuse for people to run around crazy, like. Um, so one of the GPS points, uh, a 50 pointer, was in a construction site. It turns out I didn't know because when we got to the campus, it didn't look like it did on on Google Maps. It looked like a yeah, you know, it looked like a, um, you know, just a regular place. So this guy shows up and he comes back really, really, really late. And we said, you know, what happened? Are you okay? And he said, well, yeah, I was trying to get that 50 pointer in the construction site uh, for the last 20 minutes. And I said, well, what happened? Did you get it? He said, well, yeah. So I walked up to the construction site and I and I got the construction worker's attention. I said, hey, uh, can you just take my phone for a minute and hold it over there in the middle of the construction site so I can get the point? And the construction worker was like, sure, I'll take your phone. He walks over, oh, I got 50 points. What the heck are you doing? And the guy said, well, I'm playing this game. It's called Map Attack. It's real life Pac-Man. It's really fun. And the construction worker said, like, in the last 15 years that I've worked uh, on this campus, I've never had anybody come up and talk to me. I just see everybody walking around in their phones, not doing anything, not, not understanding what they're doing, not talking to each other, just 
being focused. And he said, this is great. And so they had this giant philosophical conversation about, <laughs> about like, the future of computing and how this actually meant something for once. Um, and so this was a fun little test game. Um, we're probably going to do a new version soon with uh, better reliability. Uh, we had people playing this all over the world. Um, it's very um, computer intensive and server intensive, though. So we found that a few things in, in this experience. One, that bringing static content to life is really important. There's so much of it all over the place. It's unformatted. There's no, um, there's no uniform way to store it and collect it and read it. It's all over the place. I was very excited about Twitter when it came out because for the first time you had kind of an RSS feed of data. You could put anything into Twitter, then you could consume it through any service, but now it's closed off to developers and it's trying to become like the next MySpace or something like that. So it's, it's not really a feasible way to connect things together. Um, so with all this data stuck on the web, we started to look for other places. This is uh, Pinball Maps of Portland. It's literally all the different pinball machines and the bars they're at in Portland, Oregon. Um, this is a map, like there's a whole United States map about this. So we talked to the founder and he said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll let you use our data. So we made this pinball machine database and this app where it would just send you a, a pinball machine ding when you got near a bar with pinball. And we went on a bar crawl this way. We said, just walk down the street until you hear a ding and then look at whatever bar it is, go in there, play around a pinball, and then walk again. Um, this was an awesome way to explore a city because first off, completely different bars than we never go to, and like there was different live shows. There was like a show of like it was like a metal show where the two main performers were dressed up like stormtroopers, and um, we were playing pinball in the background. And we got free covering into all these places because we said we're just playing pinball, so we got to listen to all this music. Um, so this this was a way where usually people were looking at this map, they'd plan their trip out. You know, people are like, I'm looking at this map and I'll plan my trip. There's no serendipity, there's no excitement, there's no, suddenly I'm getting this piece of information that I haven't seen before and I might change my experience. It's always planned, it's always, I'm gonna go on Yelp and see what's nearby and see if it has a good rating and make sure I go there and if it's not a good rating then that might be bad and my future self won't like it. So it's, you know, now <laughs> it's a lot better. Um, we also took all the geocoded Wikipedia articles and threw them into an app where everywhere you go in the world, you can get content um, based on your location. And so I was walking to work one day, and I got this notification that says, world's smallest park. I look around, like, what, you know, where, <laughs> where's this park? And it turns out, literally, it's this big. Um, and it's maintained. It has its own, like, shrubbery maintainer um, in, in the middle of this intersection. So you have to cross the intersection, stand in the median, and hang out at the park. Um, and I would have never known unless I got that message that that was actually a park and there's a bunch of history behind it. So I, I kept getting these serendipitous things about the real world, not on the internet where you're browsing around and you have serendipity. And so I was walking around and feeling great. Um, so this is an example of some of the information from Wikipedia. Um, and then we said, well, other people should be able to build on this. So we opened it up and one of these guys took all the restaurant inspection scores in Portland and made an app that says, don't eat that based on if it was a really low inspection score. So you'd walk around. This didn't make it into the store um, because the city would have gotten very mad. Um, but it's a good example of, of taking your location and information into your own hands and actually having control over reality a bit. Um, but what we learned then was that location isn't really enough. We had, and we're still trying to solve the issue of battery drain on mobile devices so you can get location all day and you can get all these notifications. The problem is, again, data format and you need other uh, pieces of the system. So, um, so I was looking kind of at the quantified self moment. So my co-founder was tracking his location at five second intervals and his sleep and his eating habits and like 15 other things. He was very interested in low friction data collection methods. Um, and uh, my friend John Lukowski talked to me one day and he said, you know, of all these newest technologies that are out there, a lot of them are for friends or for dating. And he says, I have all these friends. I can meet as many people as I want. You know, I have a wife. But at the end of it all, the least I know is about my own self. And if I could figure out a way to visualize all these different systems, then I could start to debug myself, <laughs> like a program. Or, you know, and I call this like a programmatic approach to perfect happiness. Um, so <laughs> you could take all these data sets in, you know, food and drink and stress level, who you're with, weight, you know, amount of activity or writing or noise and then figure out how to correlate that. Say, when I'm with this person, I feel miserable. Okay, well, you can edit the person out of your life. Or, <laughs> which 
you know, which my co-founder does. He edits people out of his life based on if they're, you know, um, or productivity, or if I wake up at this time in the morning, then I'm more productive than this time, or if I eat this much, then I, it's correlated with weight gain. So if you knew those things, you could start reducing, um, you know, your life to these smaller variables. Um, and I wouldn't say, like, do this religiously, but, like, do this as an interesting way of understanding something over time. Because every, you know, we are in the present shock moment. Douglas Rushkoff wrote a sequel to Future Shock called Present Shock. He said, we're no longer in Future Shock. The future is here, now we're in Present Shock. And it's really hard for us to understand on the day to day what's actually happening to us because we're, you know, we're kind of frozen in the moment of, oh, and there's all this stuff going on and there's this kind of panic architecture of all these things and notifications and buzzing going on constantly. And how do we actually like stop and have a plan and say, write something cohesive. Um, and this is what I worry about when people are growing up with, with technology that's very consumptive instead of having to build their own technology from scratch. Um, so when you correlate all these data sets, you get this kind of meaning. But the problem that we have now is that we have this whole tower of babble of different data types. Everybody said, well, we'll have a standard data type for everything, which never happened. Everything speaks a different language. Some things are proprietary. Some things are open source. You can't correlate them together. There needs to be an intermediary that kind of tries to do that. You have something like if this, then that, that kind of tries to do that. Um, and you need to have, now that we're having frictionless data gathering through smart watches and sensors and things like that, we also need frictionless correlation so that we can get these insights. Because everyone's like, oh, you can just track your sleep. Great. But you can't talk to the app that allows you to track something else. What good is it if you can't correlate anything with anything else? Like, that doesn't make any sense. That's like saying, the world is only one language, and I'm only going to support this language. No, you need to have many languages and many data sets. Um, and so, in conclusion, um, I really think that, to echo Mark Weiser's comment, that the best technology is really this invisible stuff that it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have an interface or it doesn't have a shape, but that it gets out of your way and lets you live your life and lets you connect with people more and be more human, that it amplifies your humanness. A lot of people keep trying to make these apps that say, okay, well, computers are going to act like humans now, but it doesn't work. It makes an uncanny valley. Computers should be doing what computers are best at, Chug like chugging through tons and tons of data, making a curated list, and then the human, as a curator, can then look at what actually is happening and make the executive decision. Because a human understands the human side and the computer understands the computer side. And many apps, especially if you see, you know, if you see somebody struggling with an app, they say, oh, I'm bad at computers. And it's like, no, computers are bad at you. And they have been for years. And when you naturally understand how to use an interface, then the computer is good at you. But it needs to be designed well for that, that invisible interface. So really, the technology that's good should get out of the way, let you live your life, and maybe offer helpful suggestions or show you insights about things instead of actually getting in the way. Um, so no longer this, although this is kind of cool looking. Um, but this, these are, these are two people playing the game of Map Attack, and they just scored 50 points. And they're very, very excited while we're getting our free testing done. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amber. It's a small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you very much. I really love to see what's going on behind those things. Uh, Afterwards. Yeah, so uh, you don't very often get to see a presentation like this. First time I've ever met, ever met a cyborg. They're not as scary as I first thought they were. <laughs> uh, so we've got a few minutes. So I'm sure that some of you have some questions you might like to sure. ask Amber. If you do have a question, <coughs> let me suggest that you move up to one of uh, the microphones there. And uh, we'll turn the microphone on. Or if you like, just put your hand up, shout out the question, and I'll, I'll repeat it. So I've got a question up there. Yep. All right, the question is, how far off do you see a, a chip from being inserted into your brain? OK, so there's two spectrums here that, that we're playing with. When people are afraid of technology, it's because it's enhancing above the norm. The norm right now is everybody has a cell phone in their pocket. So it's not a big deal to look at something and like walk by somebody who's talking on the phone obnoxiously. That's normal, even though it's annoying. Um, and then there's restorative technology, where everybody's OK with restorative technology. You get a bionic leg that helps you to walk better. Oh, no big deal. It's OK, because he has been you know, disabled, and now he's back to norm. And the norm is what everybody's used to. 
So the reason why a lot of people say, for instance, are afraid of Google Glass is because like 4,000 people have them right now. It's enhancing and it's expensive, right? And it's a prototype and they don't get it. They're like, oh no, it's recording you constantly. Wow, the battery would just destroy itself after like five minutes if that were the case. You know, there's many limitations. Um, so I'm very concerned about getting implants because of a number of issues. Like, so insulin pump, cool. Um, there's a lot of battery issues around that. You know, it's really great for diabetics because, you know, they can prevent diabetic attacks and things like that. So that's restorative, not scary, totally okay. Um, an implant, well, first off, technology doesn't last that long. Like, I'm pretty comfortable with understanding that most planes are run by like a 40-year-old COBOL program. That's okay, because COBOL was set up during a time in which you had to have systems that actually were 100% uptime, you know, or, or you, know, you, you have people's lives on the line. Now you've got technologies like Ruby and Python and all these other things that are abstractions on top of abstractions on top of abstractions made by students who messed around with it maybe when they were 16. And you have stuff like Twitter where, oh, oops, it's down again. Oh, it's down. Can you imagine having that embedded inside your brain? Oh, blue screen, sorry. Blue screen, sorry. <laughs> sorry, blue screen. Now, if it, were, if it were created in COBOL, like, sure, I'd have something installed inside my brain, maybe. But I don't want to have to go to the Apple Care or Google Care medical ward to get it like upgraded every two years. First of all, I live in America and there's no insurance. So unless I'm really wealthy, like I'm not going to be able to maintain that, right? Horrible. Um, I would rather be able to take something off or on. Or maybe having a security measure that like, yeah, if this was taken off and somebody ran off with it, then it would screech at them or something and like, you know, shock them. But I don't want to have it in body, inside my body because technology fails constantly. I mean, come on, it's all new. So um, insulin pump, yes, great, restorative, because there's, there's, um, you're, you're saving somebody's life. The, the, the new technology that's usually developed is, you know, there's gonna have to be lots of FDA tests and all this stuff. Um, glasses are cool, you can take them off. You can change them when there's fashion differences. <laughs> you can upgrade them. Um, if they start to get bad and shock you and give you bad biofeedback, then, you know, you can take them off and put them on your dresser and say, oh, these glasses suck, I have to get a new one. <laughs> Uh, I'm really interested in, you know, it's probably, it will, it will happen, yes. Um, I won't be the first person to beta test it like I'm beta testing these. You know, I'm going to wait for a few years before it becomes stable, and I really hope it's written in a stable language that actually has a, a certain uptime. Um, I'm, I'm seriously concerned about that, because what is going to be the main demographic for that? I, I think if you want to read more about this, you should read this book called Feed by M.T. Anderson. It's about a bunch of kids who are connected by a chip in their brain to entertainment and stuff. It really destroys generations. Even somebody two years younger than them is in a completely different media sphere and space and than their parents and anybody else. Um, people are hacking these, people are spamming them. Can you imagine having spam in your brain all the time? I mean, we already are you know, self-conscious about stuff all the time. You walk down the street, oh no, somebody looking at me weird? I mean, that's like s social spam that you're getting you know, already. You know, imagine having more of that, you know, having to block that, having to install ad block and then having somebody be like, download this cool game and you got a virus and it's a migraine for like 10 hours. <laughs> horrible. Anyway, I, those are some associated thoughts. The book Feed is a very good book about that uh, and social class. Um, social class is a big deal. And can somebody have a certain piece of technology or not? I like that song from ABC, How to Be a Zillionaire. It's, I've seen the future, I can't afford it. Um, I, I've been trying to make sure I can pr afford the future, uh, basically. If you're on the wrong side of technology, technology that you get is secondhand, makes you look bad, feel bad, you get inferior interfaces. If you're on the right side of technology, i.e. you're a certain social class that allows you to buy new things before they, um, before they fade away and get frayed, then you have access to the best interfaces and really cool new operating system updates and things like that. Um, the same with clothes, you know, you can buy new clothes before they go out and not wear them for 10 years. I like the idea that you might buy a device and wear it for 10 years. Like, I try to get shoes with a 10-year warranty. But that doesn't really do well for the industry because planned obsolescence is pretty cool. I think once you can download a new software or even hardware update to your implanted device, then maybe that would be cool. They're not going to be accessible or feasible for everybody to wear or get implanted with. So what are you going to do with like the 10% of the population that doesn't want one? Are you going to have a bunch of people going out into rural society and freaking out about all the people with implants that are connected to instant information? If you're in a business sense and you know you don't automatically you aren't automatically able to calculate the perfect golf swing to get the golf ball in there, um, and you don't get the business deal because you don't didn't have an implant, or you know, there's think of all the edge cases where it could go wrong. 
Um, anyway, read, read that book if you want a more uh, dystopian view on it. Um, I really am interested in EEG. Um, EEG is an interesting way of, of doing input. The problem is that you have to like sit there and focus with it. You can't, you know, there's all sorts of rough, random, external stuff that usually happens that prevents the signals from being clear. So um, I imagine a future in, with, in which kids are controlling technology with EEG and their parents grew up in like the fragmented multitasking generation and can't focus. And the kids want the parents to play a game with them, but the parents can't because they're all fragmented and the kids have perfect focus. I would love to see a future like that. <laughs> Total turn of tides. Um, in terms of the two generations, people say, oh, the young generation, they're great at technology. No, they're very good at using the systems that have been built by somebody else. The generation before that that grew up when the internet started um, they're good at actually putting together a computer and actually understanding how to fix the computer when it breaks. You use you know, a piece of Apple technology and you can't go, go into the registry and you can't change stuff, you can't modify the system. I mean, when I was using PCs and things like that, like I built the PC myself and then I would screw with the entire operating system until it was super lightweight. It was fun, you know? Um, that was interesting. Um, I'm really concerned that people are also sharecropping on websites. They're basically you know, being peasants on a website like, you know, Facebook or Twitter, they're not building their own identity. It's taken care of for them by a third party and that data is being sold, right? And they don't know about that very much. So I would really like a future in which people take control of their identity, have their own personal server, their personal data file. And this all sounds really nerdy right now, but consider that everybody's using these phones that look like Star Trek communicators and we've all become super nerds. And so it can happen. Um, and, and I think, you know, I'm part of this, started this movement called the Indie Web Movement, where you actually have your own identity and can store information associated with your profile. And you post to your own site and your own identity before you push it out to other places. I think that that's going to become an increasingly important thing, especially as you use a site, and then the site goes away after three years because the VC says, well, you took out a loan and you didn't make enough money, let's close the site. You know, the, our second selves and how we create our identity online is not really affiliated with our own selves. It's affiliated with a third party company. You know, it's like, wow, we're renting a house. We're renting a house online and the rent is our data, right? It would be nice if people didn't have to do that, um, but people aren't necessarily excited about that as much um, because it's not, it's not become annoying enough yet for them to become excited about that. So I also see that as like another offshoot. Probably talk too much. <laughs> uh, that, that was good. Uh, so I, I really like the, the chip implant bit, but how often do you change your phones over? Uh, early adopters will take it, but I think the rest of us will wait till we get little micro SD cards that we can just plug in and plug out and update. So let me uh, let's uh, thank Amber once again. That was a very interesting talk. And, and if if you would like to uh, have a bit more of a chat with Amber, she'll be in the the L lounge, so you can come and have a, a chat and have a look at some of the really cool stuff. Just a little bit more housekeeping. I've I've gone to my problem manager. My problem manager has rejected the. Uh, the show gizmo thing as a problem. He says there's a whole heap of unrelated incidents and so